The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov, with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan. <laughs> War changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business, the adventures of Frank Race. join Frank Race for the adventure of the Black Friars Bridge. When you think of London, you usually think of fog. But for the room in which I stood, I was catching a view that gave another impression. In the street below walked an East Indian bedecked in tunic and turban, and not far behind him a Chinese slipped along. During the last few minutes, I'd also seen several other nationalities, perhaps because the building stood only a flip and a toss from Blackfriars Bridge, with the London and West India docks only a short distance down the River Thames. And then the door opened behind me, and I had other things to consider, since this was the office of George Gilthorpe, president of the British and Colonial Life Insurance Association. I hope I haven't kept you waiting too long, Race. I've been entertained. You get quite a view from here. Do you know? I never really noticed. I don't know whether you saw it or not, Race, but there was an item in day before yesterday's paper about a man being found dead on Lower Thames Street. I noticed it. He Hit was and run insured. victim. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. That's all right. He was insured by this company. Just a nominal policy, £10,000 with double indemnity. I see, and you feel there's something wrong. Well, as you know, we're always reluctant to challenge a claim. But in this case, one of the beneficiaries has asked us to investigate. One of the beneficiaries? It sounds peculiar, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And that's why I called you in. Uh, There are three of them, all Americans, all insured with us, each a beneficiary of the others, with the survivor to get everything. Who are these people? Uh, They were with the American army over here. Uh, They decided they could do well in England, so they opened a nightclub on Villiers Street, the Golden Chest. Uh, Caters a lot to American tourists, Uh, very successful too. Which uh, partner do I contact? A man named Joseph Dennison. Uh, You'll find him at the Dunstan Hotel. It's on the Strand, uh, not far from Trafalgar Square. At the Dunstan Hotel, I was told that Dennison had just stepped out, but would be right back. He'd been expecting me, and I was to go straightway to his suite, make myself comfortable. There was no lift, so I climbed two flights to room 301. As per directions, I opened the door and stepped inside to stop dead still as something sharp pierced the skin between my shoulder blades and a voice breathed against the back of my neck. Do not cry out, monsieur, or this knife will go into your body. Just call me Whispering Smith, but I still... The money you took from my sister, where is it? I sound like a man with a past, but I still... Do not try to waste my time, or the next thrust will be deeper, much deeper. The money... Where is it? Look, baby, you're making a mistake. It was you who made the mistake when you betrayed my sister. Do you know where they have him now? In prison. In prison because of you. Why don't you take a look at me? We've never seen each other before in our lives. That I know. But I'm seeing you now, monsieur. And you're going to give me that money for my sister. Or you're going to die. How much is it? I've got about 25 pounds on me. You dare. You dare to say things like that when no, I... Now, that's all for the knife. Drop it. I, I will Come on. you first. I... Drop it. There. That's better. Now, here, let me see your face. Well, we are lovely, aren't we? Let go of me. We have something to settle first. What made you come here? You will not get away. I ask you what brought you here. I have friends. My sister has friends. From Bordeaux, you moved to Cherbourg. From Cherbourg, you came here. It has taken months, but I caught you, and you will not get away. Who's the fellow you're after? Make fun of me. It will do you no good. Look, you're making a mistake. How can you be so sure I'm the one? I find you in your apartment, and that is enough for me. This isn't my apartment. Liar. The way you came into it. I was asked to come up here and wait for a client of mine, the man who lives here, and I can prove it. I'm an insurance investigator. You can 
proof it? There's the phone. Pick it up and call the British and Colonial Insurance Association. She stared at me, then picked up the phone. Getting information, she asked for the British and Colonial office. I mentioned Gilthorpe's name, and she repeated it to the operator. A few moments later, the crisp tones of his voice came over the wire. A few words, and she glanced at me with a nod, and then handed me the phone. He wants to speak with you. Hello, Gilthorpe? Having trouble, Ray? Nothing much. I haven't been able to see Dennison yet. Oh, by the way, what was the name of that other beneficiary, the third partner? Uh, uh, hold on a moment. I'll have a look. While he was having his look, my French girl was reaching for a chair. By the time I figured her move, she was edging for the door. I lunged, but the chair was flung against my knees, and I went down. Oh, I sat up just in time to watch the door go shut. The phone had gone to the floor with me, so I picked it up again. Hello, hello, Gilthorpe. Oh, great Scott Race, what happened? It sounded uh, as though someone pushed over the piano. Oh, uh, nothing serious. Locate that name yet? Uh, yes, uh, Kennedy. Leslie Kennedy. Any other way I might help? Yes, if that fellow Dennison calls in, ask him to stay somewhere where I can find him. Uh, you might try the club, the Golden Chest. That's a thought. I will. <laughs> I called Mark Donovan and had him pick me up in a rented car. The Golden Chest operated as a night spot, all right, but it had extracurricular activities on the side. Housed in a big room, all hush-hush carpets and noise-killing drapes, a big room that in spite of the early hour had a good sprinkling of quiet people listening intently to the whir of roulette wheels. Well, hey, this is all right. It is, huh? <laughs> sure. Hey, what are you going to do now that we're here? We're gonna... I'm looking for the offices of the place. Oh, you won't need me for that. I uh, I think I'll just pick one of these tables and try out that new system of mine. Mark, you'll be wasting your time and blowing your money. No, oh, no, no, no. Not on this one, chum. The guy that invented this one used to read gas meters. He ought to know something about numbers. I knew the futility of trying to argue against a system. So I left him and moved about looking for doors that might lead me to Mr. Dennison. I was trying one near the bar when... Where do you think you're going? Eyes like a pair of nutmegs viewed me with flat truculence. And the head in which they were set was not of the type to model Adam Hatz. He was big, he was tough, and Pons couldn't have done a thing for his complexion. I shrugged and told him I was looking for Dennison. If Mr. Dennison wants to see you, he'll see you. But we don't like noisy parkers around here. Don't mind if I sit at the bar, do you? I don't care where you sit. Just stay away from the ruddy doors. I sat out of scotch and soda until he drifted away. Then I left the bar and tried another door. I opened it into a whole corridor full of more doors. I tried one or two of these without success, and then... Well, and what can I do for you? Uh, I'm sorry, I was looking for a Mr. Dennison or a Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy? Mr. Leslie Kennedy. I'm Leslie Kennedy. I hope you don't mind. I told her I didn't mind at all, and I put my heart into my words. She made you think of autumn at home. Brown hair, brown eyes, freckles still left over from a lot of summer sunshine. You didn't have to close that door. And what on earth are you staring at? Well, you really can't blame me. When I heard this place was being run by three ex-GIs, I naturally thought they'd all be masculine. I'm an ex-GI. I was a wax sergeant. So you were a wax sergeant. <laughs> it's no wonder we won the war. Well, let me get this straight. You're the third partner in this business, is that it? Why? I'm from the insurance company, British and Colonial... I'm picking up information on Ken Norwood's death. Oh. So you're with British and Colonial, are you? An American, and you're working for a British company. Oh, why don't you stop? What's that for? You'll find out. Look, why don't you pick up the phone and call British and Colonial? They'll certify me. I'm simply not interested. Maybe you have some reason for not wanting to make the call. What's the matter, Les? I buzzed for Owens. He wasn't around, so I thought I'd show something wrong. I want this man thrown out of here. I imagine you can do it just as well as Owens can. You ought to make a good try. He's big enough. <laughs> well, thanks, both of you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry. You don't need to throw him out. Just ask him to leave, will you? Will you leave, fella? To a request like that, the answer couldn't be anything else but yes. Go to the door with him, Jerry. The back door. Come on, fella, before Owens moves in. Owen sounds tough. He is. He served as a commando during the war. He'd be tough even in Jersey City. All I did was tell the girl how nice looking she was. <laughs> Women. She sometimes gets peeved with me when I tell her the same thing, and I'm her fiance. She's been upset. 
One of her partners was killed yesterday. I know. That's what I wanted to talk to her about. You're not a cop. Insurance investigator. Do you know if Miss Kennedy has any French friends? French? There's one girl in particular, dark, beautiful, comes from Bordeaux. You got me. I could ask Leslie. I suggested that he leave it for a lighter mood, and he nodded. He stood talking to me in the open doorway that opened out of a small side street. Big fellow with a stock and bond suit and a grin to match. Told me his name was Dayton. And as we talked, someone approached us from across the street. A little man, slim, with a black mustache that glistened in the light of the nearby street lamp. Is it possible that from one of you gentlemen I might procure a cigarette? Jerry Dayton nodded and reached into a pocket. I watched the little man carefully with the feeling that there was something wrong here. Dayton produced a pack of cigarettes and a box of safety matches. The Frenchman took one of the smokes. Dayton struck a match for him. The little man stared up at both of us for an instant, then nodded toward the shadows behind him. Instantly, flying figures converged on us, several of them closing in savagely. Dayton and I were jammed against the wall, but something hit me in the forehead, a jabbing, blinding blow. I was pushed down, slugged again and again and again, until I went whirling into a giant drain of spinning blackness. <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now, back to the adventures of Frank Race. came out of it with a throbbing head and a roaring in my ears. The first I could understand, but it took me a moment or so to realize that the roaring sound was a car engine. I managed to groan, and Mark Donovan spoke from the front seat. All right, take it easy. Just stay relaxed, huh? What do you think you're doing? I'm hoiding this flying bedstead back to the apartment where I will care for your battered body. Pull over to the curb right now. All right. What happened back there? Uh, all I know is this. I was at one of the roulette tables when there comes a hollow below from outside. So I dashes out with several other people. And there you was, unconscious on the sidewalk. From what I heard, if some cops hadn't barreled up just in time, you wouldn't even have been unconscious. You would have been dead. Hey, a cheer for the bobbies. What about the fellow I was with, Dayton? He was lying there, too. Look what hit you guys, a bazooka barrage? Take me back there. Now, wait a second. I'm you all right. Swing this thing around and head back. <laughs> weather for London, a clear night with a full moon lighting the street in front of the golden chest. The street quiet and tranquil until Mark ran afoul of trouble in the form of another vehicle. Hey! Why, you cross-eyed moron? What do you think you're doing? Mark. Wait a minute. You drive like an old lady, a mutton-headed mule. Marcus, I would like to point out something. Are you kidding? That guy was on the wrong side of the street. Marcus, this is England. You were on the wrong side of the street. You what? certainly were on the wrong side of the street, and I'd like to know what's the idea of yelling at me like that. There were two of them standing beside the car. Now the smaller, older man spoke up. And you're disturbing the peace. So I'm disturbing the peace, huh? What do you think you guys are, anyway? My name is Dennis, and I happen to run this place. Well, now, ain't that something? And I suppose uh, your pal is the king himself, huh? No, sir. The name is MacDonald. Inspector, Scotland Yard. Scott. Oh. Uh, Race, you think we've got enough cash to buy me a bail bond? If you'll stop quacking long enough, I might be able to get you out of this. My name is Race, gentlemen. I'm representing the British and Colonial Insurance Association. I shall take care of the damage. Race, did you say? That's it. And if you're a Denison, you're the man I've been looking for. Oh, it's a great way we meet. Brooklyn-style driving in London. <laughs> We're probably fortunate to be alive. Well, forget it. We've got more important things to talk about. Yes. You can tell me about your partner's death. Well, Ken was found on Lower Thames Street in Billingsgate. It was made to look like an accident, but I'm claiming he was murdered. Ken Norwood was too sharp, too fast on his feet to get clipped by a car. I say he was slugged first and then run over to make it seem accidental. Ken was murdered. Any ideas as to why? Well, Ken, Les Kennedy, and myself been doing all right with our club, the Golden Chest. But somebody's trying to muscle in Chicago style. Somebody who? How do I know? Just having trouble, that's all. 
Hired hands getting pushed around. Now Ken Norwood gets knocked off. That's why I call the insurance company. I want everybody in on the act. I want to straighten out. Let's go down to the morgue and have a look at Norwood's body. What's your verdict, Inspector? Well, it might be murder, but there seems to be no indication of anything but a motor car accident, hit and run. This, uh, this mark on his temple, had you noticed that? The bruise? Aye, we noticed it. Could well have been put there by a fender or some other part of a motor car. Do you mind telling me if you've been in France recently, Mr. Dennison? France? Well, yes, I was there a few months ago. Why? Oh, nothing tangible. You have a man named Owens working at the Golden Chest. What's the story on him? He's our bouncer. Good man. Cockney. Oh, so that was Owens. I've uh, already met him. Uh, have you seen enough here, Race? I think so. Well, then let's get out of the place. It doesn't make me happy. By the way, Marcus, how did you come out with your roulette system? Well, now look, it was like this, right? You were See, clean. I, I uh, uh, in a way, a whole vacuum couldn't have done a better job. Hey, what's with this place, anyway? It's Dennison's hotel. He's going to join us here as soon as he finishes with the Scotland Yard man. You know, I don't get that Dennison guy. Look, why should he squawk over getting paid off on an insurance policy? It ain't natural. Well, you might have something there, Mark. I don't know. At this point, I don't know much of anything about the case. Well, you don't seem to be here yet. What do we do now? We step in and... Well, so you're here again. And again you come into this apartment as though you possess it. Oh, the French time, huh? Yeah. Real pip. Wait a minute. She's been going through this, Oui, joint. monsieur. I have been going through it. And I've found part of the money taken from my sister. Look, French franc. The fact that you find a few francs doesn't mean that they're part of the stolen money. No, monsieur. Then look also at this. A paper band with the stamp of the postal department. The postal department of France. Let me see that. Oh, no. You try to take it away from me. And... So now it's a gun. The British police don't like guns. You aren't like it either if you make a wrong move. There. Now you will come with me while your companion stays here. Wait a minute. You ain't going, Race. Doesn't look as though I have much choice with this gun against my spine. Where are we heading, baby? To the police, who do not like guns. You're making a mistake, baby, just as you did when you sent your friends against me earlier this evening. I sent no one against you. What's the matter? It looks as though you are the one who has friends this time. Those men across the street. Well, they are not going to... Oh! Oh! Please go away. Uh, are you badly hurt? I don't think so. Hit my arm, but... They're, they're trying to kill us. Let me have that pistol. No, I will keep it. And when they fire the next... Ah! A hit? You're good. We're gonna have the police here. Do you still think I'm the bad boy in this piece? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's about time we cracked it open. We're going back to Dennison's apartment. He might be there now. I will find him alone, monsieur, at the Golden Crest. Wait! Oh, just no use, Race. The place is tied in the drum. After all, it's almost four in the morning. And how do you know the dame came here? She was after Dennison. Come on, we're going around the back of the club. There's another door there. Uh, running, running, running. Suppose we do find a door, then what? It's going to be locked. Yeah, yeah, but... Hey, hold it. Look, now what's the matter? If you'd only tell... Holy cow, would you look at that? A guy hanging out the window. By his neck. It was an open window about six feet above the street. The body that swayed there had its toes within two or three inches of the sidewalk. Wait a second, I'll turn my flashlight on it. Well, that poor guy, if he'd only been a couple inches taller. Uh, here's a light. Now look, uh... hey, Race, is that guy Dennison? Yes, and he's as dead as he'll ever be. He must have done it himself on that belt. Look, 
Put the light back on his face again, Mark. No, no, over a little. Yeah, that's it. Did he? Yeah. What are you looking at? That square bruise on his temple. It's exactly like the one we saw on his partner in the morgue. This man didn't commit suicide, Mark. He's been murdered. <laughs> I spent most of the next day in our own hotel room, making phone calls across the channel to Paris, France. At the end of it, I figured I had the picture pretty complete. Early in the evening, Mark and I went back to the golden chest so I could see Leslie Kennedy. She gave me a wan smile as I stepped into her office. I want to apologize to you, Race. I've had a lot on my mind, and I've been very difficult. Oh, well. What's on your mind? Your partner's theory about thugs trying to move in and take over this business. Dennison was right. Thoroughly right. I'm listening. Ever since the end of the war, a lot of renegades have been roving the continent. Poles, Germans, French, Americans, all nationalities. Marauding and murdering. Now a gang of them has moved into England. And that's what we're up against, huh? That and more. Where's Jerry Dayton been living? Jerry? With Joe Dennison, why? Ah, that explains the little matter of a French girl who's been haunting Dennison's apartment. How, how deeply are you in love with Dayton? I, I wish I knew. And again, I'm going to ask why. I hate to say this. You better drop him. I got a make on that lad today from Paris. It's hard to believe, but he's a renegade American. He's been the leader of one of those marauding gangs for several years. He's a thief. And a killer. I... I wish I'd heard that a little sooner, Race. You see, I married Jerry Dayton this very morning. You married? Yeah. I wasn't sure I wanted to, but... our dear little Leslie fell for a whirlwind courtship. Oh, I'm sorry. But don't blame yourself, Leslie. He's a smooth operator all the way. He must have known about these insurance policies you three had. Well, that's not all. He knew that I, as a survivor, would inherit this business. And he made sure that you'd be the survivor when he murdered your two partners. And now... And now he moves in and takes everything over legally. Jerry. He stood just clear of the half-open door, looking like a blonde chorus boy, holding an automatic in one hand while he pushed a cigarette into his mouth with the other. <laughs> so you're not sure you care for me. Is that it, Les? She should have paid more attention to her woman's intuition. I had you figured for a problem, Char Race. OSS boy too smart. Which was why you had me set up for that beating last night, wasn't it? You could have been a little smarter and backed out. Now, I'm going to have to kill you. You too, Leslie. That would be a little hard to pull off, won't it? I'll arrange it. I've handled bigger things. Such as talking that little French postal clerk into stealing money for you? I happen to run short on funds. You have for a cigarette? No, thank you. Well, I'll smoke one for both of us. What tipped you off to me, anyway? Those matches you carry. The box. Oh. I might have known you'd remember that. Remember what, Race? A box of safety matches and a clenched fist. It becomes lethal when you hit a man alongside the head with it. It was a trick we used during the war when we needed a fast, unobtrusive weapon. Dayton used it on both Norwood and Dennison. His friends. But it left a little square bruise on each of them. No one else will get hep to it, though. And here's where I make it work again on you. You are wrong, monsieur. You are never going to make it work again. Oh, dames, dames, dames. What would you do without dames, Race? Now, wait a minute, Marcus. Ah, now, wait a minute. When I'm not around, I even get you out of jams. He's going to live, Race. The doctor just told me. Well, he won't live long, lady. When they get him for murder in this country, they hang him sure and they hang him high. Hey, now take it easy, Mark. You know, this happens to be his wife. I'll get over it, Race. I think I've had a very narrow escape, and I'm... I'm very grateful for what you've done. Well, then, do me a favor. Give that French girl a helping hand. You know, a little money would do an awful lot toward getting her kid sister out of a French prison. I'll do that, Race. Good. That's swell. Marcus? Yeah? We shall go now. We've got to see about a plane for New York. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Look, 
I ain't gonna fly. Oh, yes, you are. No, I ain't gonna fly. <laughs> oh, you know, yes, you are, Marcus. You know what? Now, I'm Mark, gonna go. Look, it's a think. matter of time. We have another case waiting, my boy. Do you know what I'm gonna do when we get back? No, what are you gonna do when you get back? I'm gonna get one of those little brass plates, a nameplate. Uh huh. And I'm gonna have this printed on it. Yes. Mark Donovan, boy aeroplane. <laughs> 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 Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Gene Bates, Michael Ann Barrett, Tom Holland, Bill Crawford, and William Johnstone. This series is written and directed by Joel Murcott and Buckley Angel. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a BPS production.